Okay, it is 1015 on the nose. We're going to go ahead and get our session started. And first of all, make sure that you gals are muted because you're both in the same room, close proximity. So we'll just make sure you're muted for right this moment. Welcome everybody to session 1E. Our first session here today is sustaining traditional foods in, with science and technology with our guests, Amy Foote, executive chef of the Alaska Native Medical Center and Lori Irwin of the Space Farming Institute. Welcome gals. Oh, I just saw Amy pop into Lori's screen there. <laughs> For those of you in the audience, <laughs> these two gals are sitting next to each other. Yeah, they have different Zoom backgrounds. Um, I'll allow you guys to introduce your own talk, but I just want to do a quick reminder for everybody before we get started that the session is being recorded. So if you don't wish to be on video, uh, go ahead and remember to keep your camera off. My name is Nicola Revelo. I work for the Homer Soil and Water Conservation District down here in Homer as the Food Systems Analyst and Outreach Coordinator. So you may have seen Facebook posts that we put out there helping share the good word about food systems and opportunities in Alaska. Uh, we will be watching the chat box. If you have any questions for our presenters, feel free to put them in there or just chat amongst yourselves, comment about the great things they're about to share. Gals, go ahead and take it away. Okay, we're going to talk about how Alaska and NASA have a lot in common. Um, and we do that because we teach students, and it's students of all ages, um, how um, NASA's deep space exploration missions uh, are, are so in tune with our Arctic climate, with our long months of freezing weather and darkness, um, our complicated accessibility issues, being able to only fly in or by water, um, and that we, we specifically have a unique understanding of what it's like to live on a future lunar surface colony or on Mars, and I believe that we should be uh, NASA's testing ground. And that's a, a big thing for us. Is that school I'm sharing? No, she's doing it. Okay. Um, so next, next slide, please. I don't see it up either. Actually, I, uh, have I, uh, I have so that you guys can screen share your, your presentation. Okay. Was, yeah, I'm she's putting it up right now. It's, it's not going okay. through at the moment. I'll just keep talking while we get that. Um, so today with NASA, uh, it, it started back, let me back up. Uh, NASA started a clean air study back in the 1980s and it was done for air pollution abatement. Um, and what that meant was we were gonna start evaluating what it's like to clean the air for astronauts in space from benzene and from maldehyde and trichloroethylene, all toxins. And these get released even today in our homes and in our schools uh, through things like paper. And so this research was done originally mm -hmm. with, with plants. And so they were trying to figure out uh, how can we, using plants, create this um, air pollution abatement system within the, the cycle of what's going on within these closed inhabitants out in space. Mm -hmm. And so that was one of the things that was a really big deal for them. Um, so one of the things that we looked at was how can we apply that right now today, all of this wonderful brand new science, this is leading edge technology that's being developed for these space explorations. How can we use that in Alaska today? And more importantly, how can we use that with, um, how can we use that with, um, with growing food? Really, how can we get ahead of that? How can we make that happen? And so this is the part that we really wanted to get to. So what we decided to do was to start using uh, technology that's readily available that not many people are using and, and just put it to work. So sciences that we can look at from um, different types of lighting spectrum, different types of nutrition, um, different types of um, ways that we actually grow the plants. What would that look like? So we've now gone from tropical plants back in the 1980s that actually just clean the air to literally growing food. And what would that look like? And so we picked this picture because it kind of allows us to see 
what Alaska has in common with space. And everybody knows what the aurora is, and I find this fascinating. And so um, this picture was, was given to me for use today by a special friend. And I just want to acknowledge Kim for letting me use this really important picture to, to do that tie-in between Alaska Food Systems and NASA and space exploration. So this um, research study now has gone and we're doing research on the International Space Station. And the International Space Station has been growing food to see how food grows in space, which is really weird, kind of like Alaska sometimes. So we look at everything there from what lighting spectrums we're using, water behaves differently in space. It does the same thing in Alaska in the wintertime when we're trying to grow foods indoors. So things um, don't work the way you'd think so. Uh, a couple of the things that we have a problem with is specifically water and how does that work? And surface tension is a big deal. Temperatures for the plants are a big deal. How do they uptake nutrients? Um, the very first lettuce ever tasted in space was done by Scott Kelly, who's now a, a politician in, in Washington, D.C. and understands not only the power of NASA, but what this can do for food in general across the United States. And this pink picture on the bottom that you can see is actually the growing unit that they're using right now on the space station for different types of studies. And how does that work? And so where we're at a Space Farming Institute um, is we're at the intersection now of food, soil, water, climate change, obviously, these new emerging green technologies, agriculture as a paradigm shift and change is going through what I think is called a renaissance and, and space exploration. And then using all of that new science, all of that new technology um, today and actually proving some of this stuff. So we're at this nexus of sustainable fuels, uh, sustainable foods, and we can actually use some of these foods, these, these byproducts of foods, um, to create biofuels. And this to me is hugely important, especially in the villages, to help cut down fuel costs. So imagine growing a tomato or a potato, and you don't eat all of that plant. Now we can use that in a fuel system that will help create the power that we need to grow the food that we want to grow. Um, or even in our homes to help offset some of those costs. Huge thing for us. It's, um, it's a way that we're gonna change what we eat and how we grow our food year round. And it's going to be such an exciting time. So I'm so excited that you can join us. So one of the projects that we have through the Space Farming Institute is a brand new project we started this year. We were allowed to participate in a project called Growing Beyond Earth. And it's done with Fairchild Botanical Gardens out of Florida. And they have a grant from NASA. And we are the first in the state of Alaska. And uh, right now we're the only in the state of Alaska during this research. And our kids this year were given the challenge to grow radishes like astronauts will be doing in space. And our kids just knocked it out of the park. So our first project was to grow in sand and see what it would be like. And then the next project was kids to do their own original research. And we'll be doing more information on that later. The kids are actually gonna be presenting their research, all the stuff that we've just finished growing uh, to NASA scientists in April. So I really can't talk much more about that until after they've, they've done their big presentation. And when we talk about food security, we're talking about being able to grow foods that we love. We're using um, breakthrough science, we're using brand new technology. We're, we're inventing new equipment to use to make things work. But most of all, and I think Chef Amy would find this amazing, um, we were able to grow food that had flavor. <laughs> Lots of flavor. <laughs> and I think that's why Chef Amy and I get along so well. <laughs> we both love food. <laughs> um, and so part of this is learning how to grow the plants the way they want to be grown. And what does that require? And, and understanding if you get the plants to grow the way they want to grow, then we get the nutrition that we're looking for from the plants, from the produce. Um, and this also gives us that lead in them that we've been desperately looking for to be able to end our dependency on importing 95% of the foods from outside the state. And we learned this before the earthquake, but we didn't take action on it. And then with the earthquake, it became a big major thing. All of a sudden there was a food disruption. Um, and then with the pandemic has become even more so. 
having a big impact on what kind of foods we can get from where. Um, and when we start growing our own food, we can actually create a multi-billion dollar industry and make brand new jobs all over the state of Alaska. So in our uh, starting from scratch pilot project we're doing from the Anchorage School District, uh, I started working with their outreach dietitian, Sherry White, and we are teaching students from fourth grade to eighth grade, they won't let me into high school right now, um, how to grow foods hands-on in their classroom. So you see these tower gardens behind us. I invented those for uh, kids to be able to actually plant them. They monitor the plant growth. Uh, they get to see where their food comes from. And then they actually get to participate in the harvesting of the food that they've grown in their classroom and they get to taste it, which is all very fascinating for them. They have no connection to the, the earth. Generally, most of these kids are city kids and they have no idea where their food comes other than the grocery store. So they're really excited about this kind of learning that they're getting. And we're teaching STEM. So we're teaching them how astronauts are growing food in space and they're understanding the technology of how to be able to do this in their classroom. They're understanding the engineering behind it, how the water flows and what the equipment does, why everything's set on timers to make it easy for teachers. Um, and then, then the harvest part, I think, is their, their most fun time. And one of the things I found really important about this program is the introduction of traditional flavors during early childhood development. So having that um, connection to culture and, and teaching kids what flavors are. So I think now that's something I feel like is really important about what we're doing. Oh, and it's really funny in the classrooms when the kids taste food that actually has flavor because it's fresh, right? Mm -hmm. Their eyes get real wide and their mouths get real kind of puckered sometimes. And, and they're just like, what is that? Why does it taste like that? What is that? It's their first introduction to true flavor. So it's very exciting. And then in our food is medicine program with Chef Amy, uh, what we're trying to do is, is expand the role of food in the healthcare system. And what we're doing now is our partnership allows Chef Amy to tell me what she wants me to grow in partnership with their registered dietitians for a specific new meal plan for the patients in the hospital. So they can get things like yarrow and fireweed. And um, we've been growing some sorrel for you guys, or sorrel, depending on how you say it, potatoes, potatoes. <laughs> and it's just been delicious. And so we've got lots of different ways to look at food security. And, and mostly it's not just, you know, technology and the fact that, you know, we're able to do this now year round for the first time in Alaska, which is just huge. We're also looking what sustainable agriculture means so that we're not having a, a, a bad impact on the environment. And so we're choosing things that are natural. What you see in this picture is some microgreens that we grew for Chef Amy. Um, this is the, the sorrel that we grew. And we're using a product called Coco Choir. And you can see how beautiful those roots are growing right through that. Um, and instead of using something that's not sustainable, like rock wool, which can be only used one time and will fill up our landfills, this will actually help enrich our soils and make other things do well as, as, a, as a consequence. It's kind of a companion planting thing. For sustainability, we're also looking at um, what types of plants work well with each other, which is a really big deal. Uh, we're researching the impacts of not only air quality, which we have a program we're gonna be doing here shortly with cool climate out of uh, Fairbanks, um, we're also looking at uh, water recipes. We're looking at indoor lighting recipes. NASA had us use a specific recipe for red, blue, green, and white lights when we were growing the, the radishes. There's research study that's a brand new field that's just developing now that talks all about different types of light spectrums. Um, and in this study, you can see, and Chef Amy tried it this morning, there's a big difference in flavor between growing under more of a blue light than under a red blue light. Yeah, so I got to sample some uh, clover that we are testing, um, one of our experiments in the lab. And uh, the blue light was a little bit uh, more like clover. It had a little stronger flavor. Um, and the red light was a very soft, almost like a pea tendril flavor. So it's really interesting um, how the little changes that we can make can, can intensify and change the flavors and as well as the nutritional content. So. Um, we're learning as we go, experimenting. Mm -hmm. And you can see in these trays underneath, this is a part of our companion planting. 
And let me just explain what companion planting used to be, right? And now we're taking it to this next level. Companion planting started out as uh, the three sisters, and many of you probably know what that means. Uh, we grew corn so that it would pre pretend that it was a big tall stalk, right, as it grew. And uh, then the, the beans would be able to use that for the trellising to be able to grow up. And then it would provide nitrogen to the roots for the benefit of all the plants. And then the squash would protect the roots from drying out. And they would also be able to use the nitrogen provided by the beans. So this companion planting and the wisdom of the plants allowed you to increase not only the nutrition and the productivity of the plants, but by having them all together, we got this great symbiotic support of each other. And it not only enriched the land, it helped the pollinators, it deterred wests, pests, and weeds. It's just a wonderful way of creating biodiversity. And it's a marriage between traditional indigenous knowledge and modern technology. And that's really what our partnership is about. Yes, it is. And so if you look at these trays, we're trying the same thing, but we're doing it with really tiny little baby plants. These are microgreens. And we're using a couple of different varieties of plants to see if by planting them together, they make everybody grow better. And do we get a really great harvest as well as, do we get maybe more nutrition? Do we get more flavor? So this is where I get to share, um, I, I guess, my passion and, and uh, where this is, is going uh, at the Alaska Native Medical Center. But food is medicine. And, and those of you who have heard me or seen me present before, I'm sure you've seen these slides. Um, this is uh, healing uh, right there before your eyes, before food. Um, this is a, a, a patient of ours that um, was able to have some traditional food in her room. And you can see by that bright, beautiful smile that, that she's absolutely feeling right before our eyes. So we're looking at um, adding some traditional plants and plant-based foods. We're looking at uh, lowering the refined foods that we have so that we can focus on treating um, our patients' needs, whether we're looking at diabetes or heart health, or we're looking at um, increased fiber for colon cancer treatment. Um, here's some photos of the beautiful salads that we've been, and, and fish that we've been serving. Um, these are microgreens. They're really dense superfoods. Um, they're, they're just packed with flavor. They're packed with um, nutrient dense healing items. And so we're looking at um, healing our patients you know, one meal at a time, I think mm -hmm. is the beauty in this. And when Lori and I first started talking, I said, hey, you know, how amazing would it be if we could, we could grow fireweed? And um, I have to tell you that that dream is alive and we have some um, fireweed babies. Uh, I call them my babies. Um, Lori tends to them, but the fireweed babies, I have, I have some yarn with me right now as well. Um, but these are going to make a huge difference. And what we're doing in this is we're taking our registered dietitians, our executive chef, and the end grower, right? And we're bringing us all together to become part of the care team. It's really, um, I think, groundbreaking, but it's very intuitive to what our way of life is. Okay, so. <laughs> Chef Amy loves this picture. <laughs> I love this picture. I, 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 I picked on Lori because um, I said that that is her infinity and beyond, but it is, it's the vision, right? We're looking at growing um, traditional plants and foods. We are looking at securing and building um, food security in Alaska. Um, we're passionate about what we're doing. We're looking at um, supporting local and long-term cultural food systems. We wanna support throughout the state, right? And then food is our comfort, it's our healing, it's our home, it's our way of getting folks at our hospital back out and back to their lives. So I just want to talk about microgreens for a quick second here. For, for the healthcare providers who are listening or the educators who are listening to what we're talking about, you may not know what microgreens are, so let me just start with that. Microgreens are a stage of growth. And so when Chef Amy and I are talking about what does she need for her menu, uh, we don't talk about a plant, right? We talk about the plant, but we talk about the stage of growth. So microgreens is after it's first germinated and you get that next set of leaves, right? So the first leaves we, we call cotyledons. 
I tell the kids those are the solar rays. That's how the plant gets up and it gets growing and starts to convert all of that energy into sugar so that it can make more plants. And then the next leaves are what we call true leaves. And that's when you actually get to see what that plant is gonna be like. Is it gonna have a frilly leaf? Is it gonna have more of a spinach type leaf? What's it gonna look like and how is it gonna act? And scientists have researched these micrograins and are just coming to a shocking conclusion, which we've all known forever, um, that some of these foods have as much as 40 times as much nutrition in this baby stage just coming out of the seeds as they do when they become mature leaves. And so that's one of the things that I find really fascinating is that this is the first hospital that I know of in the United States that's actually using microgreens and the super powerful nutrition to be able to help patients and, and doing it from the inside out. Um, and so when we talk about things like dandelion, you can use all parts of the plant. So we talk about microgreens, we talk about baby leaf size, which is the, the age or leaf of the, the size of the leaf, mature leaves, which are a little bit more bitter, but they have a completely different flavor mm -hmm. and they have a different uh, set of nutrition and compounds with it. Uh, Chef Amy talked to me about uh, flowers she wants to use for them. That's right. The rest of the world is trying to kill all the dandelions, and I'm begging the space farm to grow me dandelions so I can feed them to the patients. Right, but she's got two different ages of edible flowers, too. She's got the caper stage before the flower actually opens, and then the open flower stage as well. And then you can use the roots, and you can, what were you doing with the roots the other day? The roots can be made into like a coffee drink. It's almost a coffee substitute. Mm -hmm. Um, but it's got much more nutrient dense. Um, it's worthwhile. It's worth drinking. Right. And it can be, it's, it's an anti-inflammatory. So that's a huge thing for healthcare providers to know. Um, it can be used for a stomach, the liver, and gallbladder. Um, Lots of research with dandelion right? uh, for, for cancer as well. Mm -hmm. yeah. it's, it can also be used for eczema and skin conditions, right? So um, one of my favorites is the Sorel. If you haven't had any um, Sorel, then you absolutely need to find somebody who's got some and taste test it for yourself. It has this wonderful sunshiny flavor that just makes you feel like spring. And with our cold snow outside and it's still kind of dark, this just brightens up my winter. This comes actually in two different sizes or two different varieties, let's put it that way. We have one that is the green leaf, which is my favorite. And then we have another one, which is a red green sorrel. And that one's a little bit more on the bitter side, um, which I think more like traditional foods. Um, yeah, it's got a similar flavor to like a dock or a sour dock. It's got mm -hmm. that nice kind of rhubarb bitterness flavor in right. there uh, from a chef and kind of a culinary art perspective. Of course, the red vein is another fun thing. It brings mm -hmm. up, you know, it's got that wow factor, so we really like that as well. So presentation too, besides just Absolutely. eating the food, but presentation. With our eyes. Yeah. Oh, exciting. <laughs> Fire me. <laughs> These are the ones that I'm excited about uh, very much so. You can see um, those are our babies, and they're coming along. I did at one point see the Lori. How amazing will it be if we can figure out how to grow fireweed to, to bloom and maybe, you know, emotionally help kill our patients in January when it's dark and it's stark. And so I've challenged her to see if, if we can have fireweed blooms maybe in January next year. So we're working on the research right now. So I'll have that accomplished by January of next year. <laughs> um, some of the things that, that fireweed is really good for is an antiviral and antibacterial. And so when, when I started working with my friend Kim, and she introduced me to Chef Amy, we were talking about how to make this really great traditional tea mm -hmm. so that we could prevent ever having some of these issues that are happening, especially with COVID right now. Mm -hmm. We thought this was really interesting. Fireweed is a known healer, right? Mm -hmm. And so we were talking about how to make this probiotic tea so we could bump up our immune system. So if we were exposed to something, you know, the flu, whatever, um, we would have the ability to be able to fight it off and not become deathly sick from it. And that's where this whole thing started. And all parts of the fireweed are edible too, aren't they? Absolutely. Shoots, roots, leaves, blooms. All good stuff. Mm -hmm. And then uh, we started the experiment to begin with, with plantain. My friend Kim brought me some, some seeds and said, I know that it's October, but I'd really like some plantain. Can you, 
can you see if you can grow this? So the answer is yes, we're learning how. Uh, we've already learned quite a bit about this particular plant in our systems, and we know that it doesn't like wet feet. It likes a little bit drier. Uh, we know it likes uh, the red light. It has a really great flavor under the red light versus the blue light, so that's really good. Um, and we've learned that it's a slow growing plant. So this is gonna be one of those things that we, we tend to love on the journey of it getting to the point where we can enjoy it. So you can see there's a, a long list of items that um, we kind of put forward uh, to try. Um, yellow dock, sour dock, those kind of things, uh, yarrow, nettles, um, dandelions were one, right? Um, if you have um, suggestions or, or you're looking, um, have some ideas uh, for traditional plants that maybe aren't on there, um, you know, our information's at the end here. And uh, we'd love to hear what those traditional um, plants are. And, um, you know, if you're out and about harvesting, obviously, maybe not right now, um, and you have some seeds, we would love to play with those and, and see what we can do with them. Yeah. yeah. So um, from a Space Farming Institute, we are looking at creating uh, a new, larger project than we've got right now in our living lab. And when I told Chef Amy about this, she was like, oh, you have to share this with everyone. So our, our project concept is an astrobotany research center or an ARC. And the concept is imagine a huge 10 story building filled with food. And we're learning how to grow it so that we can provide all of the meals necessary for the hospital and all of the uh, outreach programs that they serve. Um, and so to be able to do that, we have to invent some new technology that doesn't exist right now. I'm a little frustrated with some of the things that, that I can't get. The price of plastic is going up. So I think that we should eliminate that altogether from our systems and go a completely different way. That's something a little bit more sustainable. Um, and I think that we haven't talked about this a lot, but I think using hemp was something that we did a lot before the 1900s. Hemp ropes were really important. I think using hemp packaging would be very sustainable and much better for our environment. So I think things like that would be new collaborations and partnerships. Well, the things that are happening in this lab, I feel like really affect all Alaskans. There's so much opportunity to learn how we can cultivate our food, even in the harshest of climates. Like I said, having fire week in the middle of, of the winter, but being able to, in our remote areas, um, have fresh, nutrient-dense, healing-type foods, or just foods in general, right? They do that on their own. Um, available is, is key um, in Alaska to our, our food security. And so um, this program, to me, and, and that vision of that is, is, is huge. That's how we get there. And, and one of the things, in case anybody's asking, is yes, we will be having apprenticeship programs as soon as we know a little bit more about these traditional foods so that we can teach people who want to do this in their own towns how to be successful and what does the plant need in order to thrive. Mm -hmm. So what we're saying is, is, is uh, the space farm is looking for partnerships. Mm -hmm. This is how you can um, get a hold of Lori and I. Do we have any questions? There was one in the chat from a little while ago. Um, somebody was asking how they can get some of the information you were talking about regarding lighting and recipes and things like that. Well, I think this the first stuff we should say it's our pilot program. So we're working on recipe development right now. And again, a lot of these are experimental, so we don't have that um, ready to publish necessary necessarily. Um, Lori is sharing preliminary some, information. Yeah, and Lori is sharing, uh, like she said, she, she has to wait to report out to um, some of those findings to their NASA report till um, next month. Uh, but Lori's contact information is right there on the top of the screen. Mm -hmm. and, and I'm generally busy in the lab or teaching, so phone calls generally don't work as well. But if you send me an email, I can generally get back to you right away. Uh, we can also schedule a tour if you want to do that mm -hmm. for your um, your your uh, corporate management team. We just did that for the hospital. We brought them all in. Mm -hmm. We grew 30 different types of microgreens for them to be able to taste test. This is the microgreen. <laughs> this <laughs> and photo them, right here, mm -hmm. you can see is all the microgreens that we tasted that day. And so we were we were introducing flavor. We were introducing the age of the plant. So some things take a little longer to grow. Some things 
grow a little faster. Some plants like wet feet, some plants like dry feet, you know, a lot like humans. We're all just a little bit different, right? And so that's what we're trying to learn how to do is, is how do plants change? And, and their food needs, their nutrients change just like people do as we age, from, from babies to toddlers to mature adults, even into our geriatric years. The, the plants' food um, responsibilities change as well. Wow. Well, very inspirational ladies. Thank you so much for taking time out of this morning to share this with you. I mean, with us, I would have never guessed. This is a, one of the more surprising presentations of the whole conference, I would say. This is just inspirational. Thank you so much. Um, yes, thank you for letting us uh, share what we're doing. Um, you know, there's a lot of amazing things going on in Alaska. And um, I think the collaboration and and sharing what we're doing with each other is really key so that people know, right? right. know what's going on in our state. Excellent. Well, as we're on a tight time schedule, folks, we'll go ahead and move forward with our next presentation, which will be from folks from the Aleutic Pride Marine Institute, speaking to us about food security and economics. We have in the room with us Annette Jaros, Maylee Branson, and Stephen Payton. So, did, did you hear that, Stephen? Just go ahead. go ahead and. Hi, Annette. Good morning, everyone. And, Stephen, I'll go ahead and make it so that you're right at the front of the screen, too. All right, thank you. Take it away, folks. Okay, um, I think I'm starting and I'm just going to give a brief introduction before I hand it off to, uh, to Annette and Stephen to give um, the majority of the talk here. My name is Miley Branson, and I am the Science Director for Chugach Regional Resources Commission in the Olytic Pride Marine Institute. Um, and we're here today to talk to you about a few of our mariculture um, and food security and economic development projects. Um, so just a brief introduction, Annette is our... Um, she wears many hats, actually. She's a, she's a, a mariculture biologist, um, and she also heads up our harmful algal bloom lab. And Stephen is our, um, he heads up the Indian General Assistance Program, and he kind of serves as our tribal liaison to, to the village folks. Um, so I think that's it as far as this slide. If we can go to the next one. Yeah, sorry. Is it showing full screen, or is it? So no. if you would go ahead and put it in slideshow mode, then we'll no. be able to see everything without the extras. There Perfect. <laughs> okay. Um, a little bit of background about Chugach Regional Resources Commission. Um, we are a tribal consortium. We represent seven um, federally, five federally recognized um, and then two other tribes in the Chugach region. So in the South Central Alaska region, and those tribes are Chiniga, Tatitlik, uh, Valdez Native Tribe, which is not federally recognized, um, the Eak Tribe, Port Graham, Nanwalik, and then Katuchik, which is not federally recognized um, in Seward. And um, we were established to manage natural resources um, and natural resource policy and engage in both terrestrial and marine science across the region on behalf of the tribes. Um, and we are, we are Primary subsidiary is the Aludic Pride Marine Institute in Seward, um, and that's where we do the majority of the mariculture science we're going to talk about today. All right, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the importance of uh, subsistence foods to our tribal members. The intrinsic value of harvesting local food in traditional ways cannot be overstated. When our tribal members lose connections to their food, they lose part of their culture, which can have negative effects on the psyche. So this poster, um, it shows animals that are harvested in our region. And the neat thing is it's laid out by season also. And then we have the classic saying of our people, when the tide is out, the table is set. Um, I'm gonna speak to Saldovia, where I'm from, um, a lot as an example here. So 
great thing about the Aluda Pride Marine Institute and what we offer our tribal members is um, uh, So we used to have, here in Soldovia, we had you know, tons of clams, great beaches. Um, people came from other villages like Port Cram and Wallach to harvest around here, as well as the locals, of course. And then we had 64 earthquake and the Exxon Valdez oil spill. All these things had negative impacts on our resources and the people. So what, um, Marine Institute can do is they come here, they help us harvest clams from beaches that still have clams and um, take them back to the hatchery, they can raise them then bring them back and outplant them to try and get uh, some numbers back up in some of our traditional, traditionally harvested areas. And uh, so the other impact that has is, you know, in places, it's been talked about a lot today in different presentations. Um, you know, when we lose, a lot of our villages are off the road system. We, you know, COVID had an effect on the supply chain. In places like Soldovia, if the state ferry stops running, we completely lose you know, we don't completely lose our way of getting food here, but the cheap way, it has to be flown in and then the prices skyrocket. And so if we can harvest our local foods, you know, we almost wouldn't be able to afford to live here. You can go to the next slide. So even here in Soldovia, it's gotten as bad as FNG is proposing to close the personal use fishery for hard shell clams. So as I mentioned before, we have um, members of the Marine Institute come down here. They're essentially creating clam gardens with us. And we don't know how long it'll take, but you know, eventually hopefully these clams will be sustaining themselves again. So, yeah. Okay. Uh, so today I just want to talk and highlight three of the projects that we have going on at Aludic Pride right now that focus on food security and economic development. Uh, so our first project that we've been doing for about two years now is our kelp mariculture project. And then we have a soft shell clam enhancement project and a cockle enhancement pro project. So just as Stephen was talking about, Olytic Pride was at first just a shellfish hatchery. So we would go out to our communities, we would collect their local species of soft shell clam, cockles, butter clams, um, whatever species they were most interested in, bring it back to our institute, our hatchery, and we'd spawn them, we'd rear them, bring it back out and try and enhance their populations at their local beaches. Um, and then we also two years ago started kelp farms and kelp test sites. So I'll get in a little more into detail of kelp right now. So currently we have a total of nine test farms or, or farms or test sites and they are located near three of our communities. Eak, which is shown right here, Tatitlik, which is right here, and Chiniga, which are all in the Prince William Sound. Um, and then here's just a little mock-up of what a kelp array or kelp farm looks like. Um, so it just shows three different species of kelp. We're currently growing sugar kelp, ribbon kelp, and bull kelp. And so how does this promote economic development and food security? Well, kelp is uh, very nutritional. It's a good food source. It can also be used for fertilizer, biofuels, cosmetics. There's, it's super versatile. Um, and we are currently developing a mobile kelp hatchery with the help of Native Conservancy. And it's pretty much just a, uh, a converted Connex shipping container. We put some flooring in, some insulated walls, um, ventilation, and we add these 12 gallon aquarium tanks, which we fill with kelp spools. And the spools are pretty much 
uh, PVC pipe with string wrapped around them and we put in uh, kelp spores and they'll grow. And then once they grow to uh, the right size, we can go out to our test farms and our, uh, our test sites and farms and we can um, put them on the rope and the rays out there and grow them over the winter. Uh, so these are grown in the off, traditionally what we consider the off season. Uh, so it can provide uh, jobs to people who um, might not have uh, work in the winter because their jobs might be fishing industry, tourist industry. So it can create some, some extra jobs and uh, extra money in communities where they might not have that opportunity during that season. And the cool thing about these mobile kelp hatcheries is that they can be shipped to really remote places. So the majority of our communities are not on the road system and it's very difficult to put in large infrastructure buildings. Um, so these can be shipped to the communities. They can be worked by local community members. Um, and then the farm, same thing. The farm is just right outside the com communities and their waters. And these uh, Connex containers, when fully functional and um, mass produced, they can create about 15 miles of seed string. Another project we have going on is softshell clam enhancement. Uh, so softshell clams are technically endemic to the east coast of North America, but they're pretty ubiquitous now around the northern hemisphere. Uh, and there's been papers uh, out recently that show that the softshell clams do not directly uh, compete with our native clams. And we've shown, um, <clears throat> we've had anecdotal evidence that local harvesters indicate that the softshell clam populations have been increasing while other native clam populations have experienced a significant decline. And we believe this is due to the softshell clams having better adaptations to warming water temperatures and ocean acidification. So because of that, we think that social clams could be a great use or a good adaptation strategy to mitigate traditional shellfish harvest loss and increase food security across Southeast Alaska. Uh, so as Stephen was saying over the last 20 to 30 years, there's been a significant decline in our local and native self, self, shellfish. Oof. Uh, so we at the Ludic Pride think that this could be a great uh, species that we can try and enhance and put on the beaches. It won't directly compete with our native species, uh, but they'll give our subsistence harvesters an additional protein source to harvest. Um, and they, they do better during uh, heat um, events. And so we think this, this might be the way to go. We also do outreach to try and tell and teach Native communities that they're there, they're an option, um, and they're quite tasty. They're a pretty uh, significant economic uh, um, project, or sorry, uh, economic, oh gosh, uh, yeah, project uh, source in New England. So they're very well harvested there, and uh, they're a big, um, yeah, economic source in New England. So we think we can bring that to Alaska. Lastly, we have cockles. Uh, so we do cockle enhancement. Cockles are a native subsistence food source here. Um, so we do cockle enhancement in our communities. And we also are trying to look in to see if they can be mass produced at a market level. Currently, cockles are not produced at the market level in Alaska, but they are in New Zealand and England. Uh, so we want to figure out if we can do that with our species here. And we believe we can do that with existing oyster techniques and uh, infrastructure. So currently we use uh, flupsies, these floating um, uh, containers that can hold all the juveniles in them. And it, it's an easy way and a low cost way to grow out juveniles. Uh, oysters is what we're using currently, but we're hoping that we can put cockles in there and it'll do the same thing. And once they reach adults, we should be able to put them into the lantern nets, just like with oysters. Uh, so we already currently have the infrastructure. We just need to, to create the seed for the, the cockles and be able to find some partners to put them out in their current currently used uh, oysters uh, infrastructure. Uh, so we believe this will diverse, diversify the mariculture industry in Alaska and add a new species for market potential. 
Um, so the final outcome is we would provide the established seed for selfish farmers um, throughout South Central Alaska. And that's all we have. Uh, if you guys have any questions or want to check us out, we have Chugach Regional Resource Commission website, Aluda Pride website, or Facebook, and here are all our emails. Miley and Stephen, if you have any other comments you'd like to make before questions, that'd be great. If you have any. Yeah, hey, thanks guys. We did have a few questions there in the chat box. There's a little bit of active chat going on. But um, the first one, in case there are folks that aren't reading the chat, is uh, from Jeanette. She asks, can you grow the kind of seaweed that is made into sheets like nori, like what you find used in sushi? I think I responded to this in the chat already, but um, we don't at the moment, but we could potentially do that. There are some limitations with genetics. Um, if we were to outplant stuff, it has to, um, it has to be, we have to collect the genetic stock from the location that we choose to outplant it. Um, so there are some, some permitting constraints, um, but yeah, the short answer is no, but we could. Okay. Um, I recall, well, I have a book that is a, largely about the decline of shellfish species uh, in Nanwalik and Port Graham, which are across Ketchumac Bay from Homer here. And that's, that trend has been, you know, watched by a variety of people, but working with the villages, can you guys just share a little bit more about uh, what people are saying about that at the ground level? Um, about the decline or? Yes. Um, just as far as, um, you know, why it's happening in 60, most people agree that the 64 earthquake, you know, had a big impact on it. I think that's when things started to go downhill. Um, the Exxon Valdez oil spill definitely didn't help. We were just, Port Graham and Wallach and Soldovia were all right on the edge of, um, you know, how far the oil reached. Um, and then there's also this constant um, conversation about the impact that sea otters have too. And there is a huge number of sea otters back in the area. Um, I don't think, I haven't heard a lot of people from the villages complain about the sea otters being an issue though. Um, I think it, you know, it's just a kind of a snowball effect, one thing after the other and over harvest. There used to be planes and boats pulled up on the beaches, you know, and just beaches completely covered and the limits on the amount of clams you're allowed to take there basically wasn't any, just some crazy number, you know, hundreds that you could collect of butter clams and steamer clams. So I think a little better, um, you know, people are collecting less because they have to, and I think they realize it's more, uh, you know, it's better for the environment because they want to be able to collect in the future can't go out and fill up 10 five gallon buckets anymore. I hope that, uh, I don't know if that answers the question. Sure, yeah, I was just looking for perspective from folks on the ground, um, staying in the villages there. There's another question in the chat from Tia. She asks, are there concerns about introducing non-native species like the cockles? I believe you guys said the cockles were native, but that the butter clams that you were introducing had a greater history on the East Coast. Yeah, the soft shell clams. Miley, were you gonna say something? Nope, you got it. Okay. Um, yeah, so, well, I don't know how you define Nate. Soft shell clams used to be in on the West Coast. Uh, they went extinct during the Ice Age, but they used to be here um are locally extinct i should say um and now they've made their way back over they were introduced i believe in san francisco in the early 1900s 
and made their way back up to Alaska. Uh, there have been papers that show that they don't directly compete um, and they have better adaptation skills for you know, change. So it's kind of hard. We want to give our native communities subsistence food that's going to last and that's going to you know have longevity and we obviously are going to keep enhancing the native species and we're trying to build up those populations um, but if they're in different habitats and it also provides a, you know an additional source of protein for our communities it's something that we're looking into and considering It's kind of an interesting little addition there. So when we were doing work here in Sedovia on one of the beaches, we found this clam. Um, you know, we were looking for native species, spider clams and steamers, and took a shovel full of gravel. It was just absolutely filled with these little Macoma-like looking clams. And we sent pictures of them around. We found out that they were some sort of invasive uh, Clam that are Asian. And, um, but in doing a little more research, we found out that they were invasive down in Oregon and Washington, Washington also. They're really bad down there. So, what they did was they changed the name and started calling them savory clams and opened up a fishery for them and uh, started selling them in the stores to get people to go out and harvest them. So, there's, uh, and we, Kind of did that same thing here when we found them. We're starting letting everybody know that there are these savory clams around, and uh, you know, you get like 20 of them in just one shovel. So, there are those, you know, potential benefits, I guess. And when was that? that? Uh, when, when was that that you guys were finding those clams that were non native? Uh, that was in 2016 or 17, probably first started doing this stuff. Very interesting. Folks in the audience, uh, any questions are welcome here in the chat. We've got some time to pick the brains of these fine young people. Perhaps you guys, well, while uh, oh, Jeanette says awesome problem solving. Uh, perhaps while you guys are waiting for folks to type questions in the chat, perhaps you could, um, discuss how you got involved with the Elliptic Pride Marine Institute. I can go first then. <laughs> um, I kind of just randomly reached out. I knew about Elliptic, I'm from the East Coast, I'm from Maryland. So I uh, was doing research with freshwater mussels in college and heard about Elliptic Pride through a friend of mine who lived up here in Seward. Um, and it, they were doing really cool research and enhancement and conservation. So I just reached out to Miley and asked if they had a position and they did. I can go next. Um, I've lived in Seward for quite a while and have been interested in marine biology for a long time. Um, and I actually reached out to Olytic Pride 10 or 15 years ago and worked there as a, as a lowly intern. And then um, they recruited me straight out of the PhD program at UAF um, a couple of years ago. And so, um, yeah, that's my story. And I uh, lived and grew up in Soldovia and I worked for a Soldovia village tribe. It's an environmental assistant, the IGAP program. And um, they re the Marine Institute reached out to us about doing some potential clam work here. And so we started working with them. And yeah, we've been working with, SVT has been working with CERC and the Marine Institute for since 2015. And um, it had a position open up. So uh, yeah, I applied or asked, you know. Now I work for CERC in their ICAP program and still work for SVT. Excellent. Well, I'm not seeing any questions come here in the chat box. Is there anything else you guys would like to share about the program or about CRRC more broadly?
Oh, there's a question right here. Uh, Anthony asks, have you collaborated with Oceans Alaska Shellfish and Seaweed Hatchery? They're doing similar things in mariculture. Um, I don't know if we have collaborated directly with them, but I know that we intersect in a lot of the um, the kind of mariculture organizations around Alaska. Um, our director, Jeff Hetrick, is is probably the better person to answer that because he's a he's a longtime mariculture guy. Um, and I, I believe that he has worked with them before, but we don't currently work with them. Okay. Well, um, I guess if there are no more questions, we can go ahead and let people break early before the next presentation, which actually is a recorded presentation. It's a pre-recorded presentation. Uh, the presentation is by it, it, well, first of all, it is uh, conservation and culture of harbor seals in the Chugach region. And our presenters for the next presentation are Raven Cunningham, also from the Chugach Regional Resources Commission. She's the Marine Mammal Coordinator and Hope Roberts of CRRC as well. They have pre-recorded the session, so it will be shown through the WOVA app. You can just go ahead and click on the link right where um, you see all the rest of the sessions in the agenda. And um, I want to thank everybody for coming and paying attention. These recordings will be made available after the conference is all done. So stay tuned to your emails. Uh, the Alaska Food Policy Council will notify all attendees when the recordings are made available. So if there's anything you didn't catch or wanted to hear not again, you can go ahead and, and check out the recording. I see Jeanette has her hand up. Jeanette, did you have a question? Yeah, I put a question in the chat and then someone else posted a similar thought. So could you check those out quickly for us, please? Okay, or you can just ask right now. Do Does the Alutic Pride reach out to fishermen to uh, say we have these strings of seed available and how, do, how does that all work? So we do, we have a number of uh, collaborating partners. We do, um, we provide seed string for, um, uh, a bunch of different kelp farmers, mostly out of Cordova. But if if you are interested in working with us, feel free to shoot us an email, and um, I can put my email in the chat because I know both of you guys asked about it. Um, but yeah, feel free to shoot us an email, and and we'd love to collaborate with more people. Thank you. Well, that's good to know that you're open for collaboration. If uh, anybody here in this room hears of another mariculture operation that they might collaborate with. Uh, Miley's putting her email in the chat, so you can go ahead and copy that down for yourself and hold on to it. Um, there is a comment here from Anthony. He says, if you're looking for oyster farmers to collaborate with um, our e plant out of cockles, I'm interested. So you have a guy on the line right now. His uh, information is right there in the chat box. Sounds great to me. <laughs> We'll definitely reach out, Anthony. Oh, there's Jeff. <laughs> hey, Linda. Sure, I know Anthony. So I said hi. And hi, Jeff. Anthony. And introduce Jeff for us. Oh, this is Jeff Hedrick. He's our director. Uh, I'm making a cameo appearance. I know Anthony. <laughs> hi, Anthony. Fantastic. Okay. Well, thank you all for your time, and enjoy the rest of the conference. There are great presentations. Check out the sponsors page where all of these generous sponsors have donated some funds to make this conference happen and make it affordable for attendees. Uh, look forward to seeing your faces in some of the other presentations. So bye for now. <laughs>